Hi there! Today, we'll talk about machine learning engineering and we'll discuss the different ways on how to design and build complex intelligent systems and workflows with Python. So I am Joshua Arvin Lat. I am the Chief Technology Officer at NewWorks Interactive Labs, and I am the author of the book, Machine Learning with Amazon SageMaker Cookbook. We will divide this talk into four parts. The first part is on getting started. We'll discuss some of the concepts that we will talk about in this session. In the second part, we will talk about different machine learning engineering solutions. In the third part, we'll talk about customization strategies. And in the fourth part, we'll build ML pipelines with a variety of solutions. So let's proceed with the first part. So how do we define machine learning? There are different ways to define machine learning, but one of the easier ways to describe it is if it's starting to get harder to do something, especially when not hard coding a solution, then we may be talking about machine learning. So one example is, let's say we want to identify if this image is a cat or not a cat, and we make use of a model which is trained using a relatively large training data set and also validated by a validation data set. And we introduce an image which is not used as part of a training set to, to generate a model. And yeah, and that model allows us to identify if this is a cat or not a cat. And if, it, if it's able to describe it correctly, then yeah, it's a good model. And there are other ways to describe machine learning, and there are de definitely a lot of other possible uh, applications of machine learning, which we'll not describe here. But this is one way to describe what machine learning is. At the same time, to produce and deploy the model that we just talked about, the machine learning process uh, needs to be there to help us uh, produce this model. So for one thing, this is a very simplified way of describing the machine learning process because in real life, this is going to involve a lot of loops and even iterations. Because after you have deployed the model, it's not really the, the end, but rather, it's just the beginning where you are able to um, collect some more data and then do retraining after a couple of weeks to a couple of months. But to keep things simplified, let's describe the machine learning process. The machine learning process uh, would involve uh, data collection. And after you have the data ready, you perform data preparation and cleaning. You visualize and analyze the data. We perform feature engineering. We do model training and parameter tuning. We do a bit of model evaluation before finally deploying the model. Now, let's talk about machine learning engineering. Data scientists are generally paired and grouped with um, developers and machine learning engineers who help upload and deploy the models into production. Because of course, even if you have completed the machine learning process and we have produced a model, ideally that model is deployed into an inference endpoint so that other systems and other users are able to make use of that trained model. So what's machine learning engineering? Let's just think about machine learning engineering as some sort of way or some sort of combination of machine learning and software engineering, which may involve a bit of DevOps engineering and so on. It, it's basically making the most out of machine learning as a science and engineering as a discipline where we're able to utilize the different um, aspects of those two fields to have something like machine learning engineering to help us perform machine learning in production environments. Also, when doing machine learning engineering, it's important for us to note that if all you have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. And a lot of us will just think of canned solutions where if we encounter a certain requirement, we just tell them, oh, we just use this framework or we just use this library. 
in real life, we will be required to use a lot of different um, tools and even techniques. And these tools and techniques may change depending on the context of what we're trying to solve. If, let's say, you were to join a team which is already using a certain framework, why introduce a tool, especially if the deadline is, let's say, tomorrow? So maybe the best solution there would be to embrace the solutions and frameworks that that team is already using. And also, when we encounter a new problem, it's important for us to note that we have to identify the different tools available before trying to suddenly just rush into the decision and choose that tool for that specific job. So yeah, so having different tools and being aware of what tools are available is a critical skill, especially when trying to solve machine learning requirements. At the same time, these tools generally make use of certain concepts. And even if one or more members of the team are more than capable of using these tools, we have to make sure that all the members of the team are capable of, of using this. Because once we run into problems in production, ideally there are more than one, there's more than one person capable of solving the requirements. That said, let's now talk about the machine learning engineering solutions that we need to be aware of, especially when dealing with, let's say, larger data sets, especially when dealing with production requirements, because being able to train and produce a machine learning model in your local machine is just the first step. And knowing some of the things which we may encounter in production is the next step before telling yourself that you're ready to take on the real stuff. So the first thing we need to, to, to be aware of is that there are many options available, similar to what we mentioned earlier. And we technically have a lot of options there where we can even build everything from scratch or we can even build our own set of tools. However, a lot of the tools and frameworks available are already mature. And in most cases, it's much better to choose a certain set of tools and frameworks or even platforms instead of building everything from scratch. For one thing, if you, let's say, have a certain team member who built everything from scratch and the other 90% of your team is making use of the tools built by that person, if that person suddenly resigned, then we will have problems there because if it, things are not properly documented, if your other members encounter a problem, then some information is lost, especially if the person who built those tools decided to join another company or to join another team, right? So being able to use um, the more commonly used frameworks and libraries and platforms will definitely help the entire team continue the project, especially if that framework and library or platform um, is properly documented and there are a lot of references using those tools. So one example that we will share here is the usage of SageMaker. And SageMaker has something called SageMaker Python SDK, which helps significantly speed up the, the, the processing of machine learning experiments in the cloud, in the AWS cloud, using just a couple of lines of code. So as you can see here, we just initialize the estimator, we specify some hyperparameters, which are configuration parameters before running the training job. And then we just use the fit method. And then after waiting for, let's say, three to five minutes after performing the training step, we can now deploy it with just a dot deploy method. So as you can see here, we were able to complete an end-to-end -end training and deployment um, phase with just maybe six or seven lines of code. And the good thing here is that we won't have to worry about the infrastructure part and even the implementation of the actual inference endpoint especially if we're just trying to do a quick POC work. So let's take a step back and ask yourself, okay, that's fast, that's cool. Well, what do we do if I need to customize things? And the cool thing here is that this framework and platform do allow us to customize things, which we will discuss in the third section of this uh, talk. 
So yeah, so as long as the tools and platforms that you are using allow this sort of customizability while allowing you to provide and produce um, results in a much shorter period of time, then th those are the tools for you. And there are different tools and SDKs and platforms available. So just use whatever is uh, most appropriate and convenient for you. At the same time, being able to try things out locally and having quick feedback is definitely one of the features that you need to look out for because instead of waiting for, let's say, five minutes for something to happen, ideally, if we are to test something which is custom, we want to try something which immediately provides us uh, a result within, let's say, a few seconds. So that when we're debugging things, it's much easier for us to know if there's something wrong with our code so that we can try again. If we were to, let's say, wait for five to 10 minutes for something to, to complete, and we will, if let's say we need 20 attempts to, to resolve something and to complete something, then that's going to take a lot of time. But if instead we have something which completes in a few seconds, then trying things out and doing 20 retries would, be, would allow us to complete something faster. Next, let's talk about the different solutions. So of course, there are a lot of icons here in the screen, but what's important here is that whenever we try to solve a problem, we should know the different options in which are available for us, especially the, de the deployment options. Whenever we have a machine learning model, we have to know that these trained models most of the time are easily portable and deployable in different environments. For example, if we, we have, let's say, trained uh, a certain model, then we may be able to deploy that inside a Lambda function, which would help us significantly save on cost. So instead of having an instance, maybe having a Lambda function would be much cheaper, especially if we're just trying to trigger it, let's say, four times a day. It's also possible to have a Lambda function which triggers a SageMaker endpoint so that you can make you can use the best of both worlds along with the different other options here and you can even deploy it inside a container using Fargate and so on one of the things that you have to take note of is that some platforms do allow quick results by providing the much needed support for let's say multi-model endpoints, multi-container endpoints, and even A-B testing in such a way that we do not have to prepare a lot of code and do a lot of custom stuff because these platforms already have this available for us and even model monitoring, even debugging. So if those um, platforms allow us to do those things with very minimal code modifications, then that's also one of the advantages of using a mature framework or platform. Another of the cooler solutions available using these platforms would be the usage of the cloud and the machine learning um, techniques, let's say automated hyperparameter tuning. So if we were to do this locally, the limit and uh, one of the challenges there would be is that there's a limit when using your local machine because you can only perform a certain number of training jobs inside your local machine because of the limit of your hardware in your local machine. However, once you migrate this into the cloud, we can actually utilize some of the cloud techniques and concepts where we can actually run a lot of training jobs all at the same time. And since these training jobs are running inside, let's say, instances which may be created and deleted only during the execution of the jobs, then we'll be able to save on cost as well, as well as time. Instead of us waiting for, let's say, 12 hours for a specific tuning job to complete, then maybe performing automated hyperparameter tuning in the cloud would help us reduce this to, let's say, 30 minutes instead, because we're able to run a lot of these jobs in parallel, or maybe concurrently. Another solution that we need to be aware of is the presence of debuggers, quote-unquote debuggers. Basically, these tools should allow us to identify quicker 
where the problem is. When we are performing machine learning experiments and deployments, a lot of time there is spent, let's say, on cleaning the data and performing a lot of retries in your experiments. And one of the challenges there is that these experiments do have a lot of differences whenever we execute things. For example, let's say that we perform this tuning job, we perform this training job, the next time we try it, the results are different. Of course, there are ways to solve that by using, let's say, um, proper seeding um, solutions. But in some cases, it's hard to debug what's happening inside those um, instances, especially when dealing with distributed setups and having the proper tools to support those debugging um, solutions um, is needed. So having something that allows us to detect if there's something wrong with the training job much earlier than usual is one of the things that we would need in an existing platform. So yeah, so the good thing there is one of the tools that I've used in the past, which is SageMaker Debugger, is available for free um, when using SageMaker. When dealing with production requirements, it's not enough that we have um, a good model. It's also important for us to be able to explain that model using the concept called ML explainability. So even if we're using, let's say, a neural network, even if we're using a very complex model, we are able to explain and reduce the impact of the black box model by allowing us to identify how it affects the final output. Let's say that we have four features um, or four columns, and then there's one target um, variable. Then using ML explainability, it just analyzes the the data, it analyzes the model, and it anal analyzes how the different features are contributing to the final outcome. And when we have something like this, and when we have something that automatically generates reports with a few lines of code, then we're able to present this much easier to the stakeholders and allow them to appreciate the model. Because in some cases, some stakeholders select less powerful models because they are easier to explain. But with ML explainability, we are able to make use of more complex models while still being able to explain this using, let's say, the SHAP values. Now, let's proceed with the exciting parts, customization. So earlier in the first part of this presentation, we talked about how to speed things up. With just a couple of lines of code, we're able to, let's say, introduce debugging, to our machine learning experiment. We're able to deploy things really quick with just a couple of lines of code, or we may be able to add a couple of lines to perform um, ML explainability report generation um, task. However, one of the things which make it hard for um, bigger teams to perform is that when they need to perform a lot of customization, the tools that they're using do not necessarily allow them to perform this customization work. However, the good thing here is that making use of other tools, let's say Docker containers, and using it properly with um, the SDKs and Python, using those tools together would allow us to select the right solution depending on the complexity level and depending on the customization level required to complete this task. So for one thing, if let's say that we want to create our own container image, yes, we can do that and simply replace it before using, let's say, the SageMaker SDK. So I'm just using the SageMaker SDK here as an example, but if you have other platforms and frameworks that you have been using and that framework allows you to do a lot of custom things, then yeah, being aware of what level of customization is available for you is the way to go. And generally, it's usually hard to look for the ref references online to help you do those customization requirements. But knowing and having the DevOps skills and using Python to do those custom solutions would definitely help you uh, a long way. 
So for example, here we have something called PyTorch training.py. And here we, let's say, load the data, prepare the model, perform training, and then we produce a model. We want to, let's say, port the code written here and use that in SageMaker or some other framework or platform. Then using, let's say, that platform which supports container technology, let's say Docker, uh, would allow us to easily port this inside that container and produce a container image so that once your training job starts, then all the training job needs to do is um, pull and make use of that container image, run the container, and then run the script inside the container. And the cool thing here is that if the infrastructure is managed, um, similar to how SageMaker is doing it, then an ML instance with a specified size would just contain the container, and that container would run the Python script inside that container. So if you have other dependencies, then we can easily install that inside the container. So one example of this is, let's say, your base container does not have, let's say, NLTK installed, and you need to do some text cleaning stuff, then yeah, you can install NLTK or the Natural Language Toolkit inside that container before your script starts to run. Being able to identify which ones are configuration parameters, identifying the S3 inputs, and also identifying the hyperparameter configuration ahead of time, and being able to utilize them inside the custom script and inside that custom container is the next step when dealing with uh, heavily custom requirements. And being able to pass it from the Jupyter Notebook up to the actual script inside the container is the next thing to take note of. And after the tray container has finished running, then we produce a model. So next, we also have to take note that sometimes people will want to modify that custom script. So being able to make use of the proper developer practices, since we're technically dealing with the script, is very important. So let's say that proper usage of, let's say, version control practices using Git flow, um, having proper coding standards um, is critical because now you are not just dealing with machine learning practices, but we're also dealing with engineering practices now. Because in the past, when you're just using Jupyter Notebooks, as long as it works, more or less, that's okay. But once we need to create custom scripts, it starts to become an engineering problem. And let's say following, let's say something like the 15 line rule or 20 line rule, which I generally use and enforce in teams, it would allow teams to have much cleaner code. So for example, if your function can only have up to 15 lines of code, then it's much easier to maintain those lines of code and so on. So once we need to work with a team and once we need to work with scripts, again, it starts to become an engineering problem. The next thing to do is once we have the model, we want to have that model hosted inside a custom container. And that custom container may have, let's say, something like a custom Flask implementation of a web API where it receives, let's say, a post request containing the data we want to use and do some predictions or something. So being able to replace your built-in solutions with something which is more custom is something which requires, of course, the web development skills. So in addition to knowing the machine learning process, it's also important that you know how to build websites because even without the front end, we should know how to build simple APIs and know the protocols needed there to return a response after receiving a request. And being aware of the needs of APIs is crucial because it's not just about responding to requests. It's about responding to requests really fast because you want an endpoint which returns an output within less than one second, for example. And you want to be able to handle the errors properly and at the same time, being able to log and detect errors 
without af affecting the experience of the integration, especially when other systems are using your endpoint as a, as an integration point. So for example, here we have a Flask API and we have this custom code. And the moment that we're able to code inside a Flask uh, web implementation here, we're now able to add up a lot of things and we're able to, to do the custom work required, especially if we want to, let's say, use this library, we want to use this tool while we're using Flask inside that container. So one of the things that people do take note of is that where do we put what? So for example, when we want to do model monitoring, do we put it inside the container or do we put it outside the container? And the, the cool thing here is that usually the platforms that we're using are, you, you usually have that support available already even if you do not implement it inside the container or, in, or the scripts inside the container. So for example here, if we want to detect drift, then we can just enable model monitoring and we do not really have to worry about that inside the scripts inside the container because model monitoring will be taken care of from a SageMaker um, inference endpoint level. So even before the request um, pass through the script, model monitoring is already doing its thing outside your container. So again, simple is better than complex and complex is better than complicated. At the end of the day, it's not about being super, it's not about having that super amazing um, engineering project, but rather being able to make things simple and being able to produce something in a really short period of time while allowing your team to produce the results that it needs. That's the thing that you need to do. And being able to convert something complicated into something that's complex is crucial because if you are able to identify the parts of your engineering system, that's going to help you identify which one is the bottleneck, which one needs to be refactored, and so on. And you can identify when is the time to support certain complex requirements because if you do not need a custom container image, then maybe using something which is built in may do the trick. So how does that work? So for one thing, if you were to propose an idea to your boss or to a stakeholder or to an investor and you need to have results within three to four hours, basically a POC work which is available in just a couple of hours, then yeah, choose something which is simple because you just need to do a demo. But once you need to have something which is production ready, something which a lot of customers will be using, then that's the time you proceed with checking the complex solutions available for you, especially those that require a lot of customization. And in the last part, we will talk about building ML pipelines because when we're talking about complexity, it's important for us to identify that in addition to solving problems using complex systems and complex processes, it's important for us to know that the, it's also becoming more complex the moment that we're dealing with a lot of machine learning experiments. For one thing, once you are able to complete one experiment, maybe in a couple of weeks, you'll be dealing with two and then three and then four, and things start to become a bit more chaotic. So being able to build ML pipelines is crucial because in addition to automating the different steps involved in the machine learning process, you're able to make things much easier for your team. For example, you have a manager, and you have multiple um, engineers and data scientists and developers, instead of the manager trying to go through the actual code when debugging things, maybe the manager can just look at, let's say, a user interface, which easily allows teams and managers to know if there's something wrong with a certain part of the system without having to go through the code. For example, if we have something like this, and let's say in the model step, or the training step, something goes wrong. Let's say there's something wrong in the training step and given that one manager in your team does not have access to the code, then maybe if the certain oblong becomes red, then your manager should be able to easily inform the team that, hey, there's something wrong with the training code 
it became red. Um, if we were to try it, and it becomes red again, and there are logs here telling us to fix this issue, then yes, the team can easily solve that issue issue because it's easy to observe where the problem happened. And being able to determine also how long a certain step took is also one of the things that's needed when dealing with ML pipelines. And when dealing with ML pipelines, it's important for us to understand that there's a lot of things we need to be aware of, especially not just the time spent on how a process completes, but rather the time the team needs to spend to debug a certain problem. The reason why we're building pipelines is to make it easy for your team to manage things and to debug things. If the pipeline solution is instead making it much harder for your team to solve things, then maybe try some other approach or try other solutions because we're not trying to build a pipeline for the sake of building a pipeline. So in order to make things easy for us, instead of us trying to build our own custom pipeline with a custom solution using Python from scratch, maybe there are existing solutions out there. Let's say the Data Science SDK along with, let's say, the SageMaker SDK, combining those two solutions together in order for us to produce something like um, a step functions implementation where we're able to use different AWS services, then that's pretty cool. And that's one of the solutions available out there. Another solution would be to make use of SageMaker pipelines where um, we're able to make use of the, the more recent um, and uh, the newer features of SageMaker um, inside SageMaker Studio, something which we see in the screen. So SageMaker pipelines more or less have a very similar way of working as with the Data Science SDK, but this one um, allows us to do other things as well. Let's say adding depends on and so on. And this one allows us to um, view and debug and inspect our uh, machine learning experiments inside SageMaker Studio as well. So yeah, so knowing the different options when building pipelines is crucial. And when you're using SageMaker pipelines, by just checking the documentation, we'll be able to see that, oh yes, um, we can even do, let's say, condition steps where we perform a certain step and then we use a certain condition step so that we can perform task A uh, instead of task B, especially if a certain condition holds true. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, when dealing with machine learning pipelines, um, it's crucial for us to know the solutions out there and being able to convert your current solutions immediately into resources using just a couple of lines of code is something that you need to, to look for. So again, to summarize, um, we were able to talk about um, what machine learning engineering is, what are the things that we need to look for when using, let's say, frameworks and tools, and what are the things that we need to be aware of when dealing with production requirements, let's say, like debugging things, identifying if there are drift issues, let's say, uh, bias drift, and so on. And we also need to be aware of the different customization strategies when dealing with more complex requirements. And then finally, making use of different, different solutions to build ML pipelines. So that's pretty much it. If you want to reach out, feel free to connect using the links provided here. So in LinkedIn and Twitter and in Medium. So again, I am Joshua Arvin Lat. I am the Chief Technology Officer of NewWorks Interactive Labs. And I'm the author of the book, Machine Learning with Amazon SageMaker Cookbook. So if you are interested in knowing more about uh, machine learning engineering in the AWS cloud using SageMaker, then feel free to check my 762 page book. So thank you again and hope you learned something new. Bye bye. Yes. Okay. So, hey, um, so welcome back to the um, machine learning track on Q&A session. And today we have um, our speaker, Joshua Avin Lat or R. Um, um, he has given a talk on SageMaker, which is a um, automated um, machine learning toolkit for um, training on cloud. 
And um, yes, so um, please introduce yourself a little bit, and then we can get into the your your paper and your talk. Okay, thank thank you for that. Um, so again, thank you for uh, inviting me here. Um, and yeah, if if you guys have questions for those watching right now, feel free to to ask any question. I'll be open to answer them. So to introduce myself, I'm Joshua Arvin Lat. People call me Arvs. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Newworks Interactive Labs, and we build a lot of stuff. I'm also the author of the book. It was released, I think, two weeks ago. So the title of the book is it's a heavy one: uh, Machine Learning with Amazon SageMaker Cookbook. So again, it's not a cookbook for food, but rather <laughs> it's, a, it's a cookbook for recipes, so solutions. Yes. To, the, to the common problems. Because when we're doing machine learning in the cloud, um, it, it gets a bit tricky because we have to worry about cost. We have to troubleshoot a bit. And the book, I wrote the book to help everyone um, use the tool properly. Because even if you have the documentation, hmm. um, getting it to work and trying to bridge the concepts, the theory to the actual thing, um, those are the missing parts. And I wanted to write a book, which if I have, if I have had that book, let's say five or six years ago, it would have been the book that I would have read to help me um, fast track my machine learning journey. Yes, and uh, I hope that book should have been published like earlier, um, early in my career actually. Um, because back in the day when I when I worked on machine learning, it, the, one of the thing is the, um, the main obstacle is about training the model. And training the model should have been automated, but back in the day, it wasn't. Therefore, it is really hard. Um, I have to, to, let's say, to tune the hyperparameters for the model, and then it was hectic. It was so detailed. Um, how would you actually solve that problem with SageMaker? Uh, yes, good question. So, yeah, so depending on the year, there are different challenges depending on the year. Because yes. I, think, I, I think this year, uh, especially last year also, there were the, the the focus area would be how do you solve the inter interpretability stuff, the legal stuff, and so on. But yeah, back in the four years ago, five years ago, or maybe longer, the challenge would be um, doing some serious training experiment um, using a lot of resources because right. uh, of course there are the frameworks, there are the the platforms, but trying to connect them and also even up to deployment, um, that's one mm. of the harder the trickier problems to solve because even if you have, let's say, trained the model, you would have to deploy it and build your own web app and combine machine learning and software engineering to, to do something, to, to be able to predict things automatically. So what SageMaker does is it provides that platform that makes it easier for people to, to do machine learning in the cloud. And one of the common misconceptions, I mean, talking about going back yes. to the misconceptions part. <laughs> yeah, so in the session earlier, we talked about misconceptions. Even myself, I had that misconception that if I were to use SageMaker, oh, do mm. I am, am I am, am I stuck using this? And I realized that uh, it was well designed in a way that if people started with TensorFlow or PyTorch or some other framework or tool or library, mm. they can easily port their code and get it to work with SageMaker because SageMaker simply mm -hmm. solves. Um, and basically, it's not there to make it to make life harder for us. Basically, it's there to mm. solve the problems that are harder to solve. Especially, let's say that. If we were to perform automated hyperparameter tuning, it's able to perform and, and launch a lot of training jobs, maybe a lot at the same time, maybe three at a time, with just a couple of lines of code. And if we need to mm. use a certain algorithm, um, we can use that because people think, oh, there's built-in algorithms. Can I use my own custom algorithm? Yes, we can. And those are the problems that's harder to look for especially if people just look at the surface. People just think, oh, SageMaker, there are built algorithms. I can use this for this NLP problem. But in reality, it's a platform where you can choose the building blocks or the, the capabilities that you need. And if you don't need some other capability that, that's built in already in SageMaker, then we have the options to do that. It's like um, there's yeah. a lot of food available, and then we just choose what we want to eat. Yeah. Mm. And... Um... Yes, um, I'm, I'm thinking about my own experience. When I did hyper hyperparameter tuning, I usually opt for grid search, where you've got to search for all possible parameter configurations. But now I, I gradually move to a, a more intelligent way of hyperparameter hyper tuning, like nail-to-meet algorithms. Um, 
is it also available on on SageMaker, or do I have to implement that mm. on my own? Yes, good good question. Um, right now there are three options. I mean, to simplify things, there are three options. Three options. Wow. Yes. Uh, the, the first one is uh, the random option. Basically, oh. the it's uh-huh. just a way to to baseline things. And the, the yes. first one is just a a dem- so some it's available as a configuration. Mm value uh, but it's more on for demo purposes to compare the the results of the smarter um uh, uh, the, the, the smarter algorithm um the, the mm-hmm. second option the smarter one I, I forgot its name but um mm-hmm. it automatically adjusts the hyperparameter configuration when there's an opportunity so I, I forgot the actual name but it's definitely much it's, it's getting much better results compared to the random one and then the third option is if you have some sort of custom or your preferred um, algorithm, let's say the evolutionary stuff, then you can also yeah. do that. And there are a lot of tutorials out there. But most of the time, um, the, the, the second option generally does the trick. Mm. Yeah, because, because um, there's a research paper, um, and I think an Amazon employee or some person prepared that research paper, and, right. and AWS simply applied that um, research paper and integrated it with SageMaker. So yeah, so let's say that you have your normal training job with let's say five lines of code. So you you initialize this class that this this class objects and so on. If we want to use let's say automated hyperparameter mm-hmm. tuning, we just need to introduce another one to two lines, and then wow, and then run the fit really? factor. Really? Yeah. Just one to two lines, and it saves yeah. your life lifetime. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. So so all we need to worry about is let's say how how long do we want it to run. Mm. Uh, what what are the thresholds? Maybe this one is um, going to skip, let's say, zero point uh, for every zero point one and so on. Right. But generally, we don't have to worry about it because it's already automated, and we can make mm. the most most out of the cloud computing opportunities. Because when you're trying it out in your local machine, the bottleneck is your local machine, so mm. you cannot run uh, the jobs in parallel or concurrently. But when you're doing it in the cloud, given that the the pricing because pricing works. Only you only pay for what you use. Meaning, mm. if you start the machine learning instance, the training job instance, that's the time you pay for the training instance. And then, it, let's say that it runs for ninety seconds to two minutes. You only pay for two minutes, not the entire twenty-four hours. Meaning, it's much cheaper. So that means that we can basically run a lot of training jobs, mm. and we can also save time because we don't have to worry about we don't have to wait for two days to to even know if the training that's job is yeah. or not, right? So we can run five at a time, and we can configure that in SageMaker. And then, in terms of cost, the training cost is significantly cheaper, and all we need to worry about would be the inference cost. And there, there are different ways to to solve that using, let's say, Lambda functions or serverless computing. Mm-hmm. And you can customize your own solution, pull the model out of the S3 bucket, and there you go. There's a chance that you can even get it for free, especially if you are someone who can customize things. Uh... I see. And one last question. Um, I think we, we still have some time. Yes. Okay. So one last question. Um, is SageMaker limited to just only AWS, or we can um, run it on our own cloud system too? Uh, good question. Mm. Um, we can install the SageMaker SDK, Python SDK, in our local machines. But right. the moment we run our training jobs, if we're not using local mode, mm. so there's an asterisk there. If we're not using local mode, then it will create resources in the cloud. Ah, I see. Yeah, I but, but, see. If, but if we were to use local mode, uh, of course, we have to install some stuff, but our local machine would mm. be the server. Oh. And we can we can we can use the platform um, shortcuts in our local machine to solve right. things, especially for the debugging things. And then when we want to run it in production, of course, SageMaker is basically AWS's product. So when when we need the real ML instances, we'll need AWS for that. But for experimentation, we can do it locally, and there are mm-hmm. tutorials for that out there. I see. Well, I've got to take a look at that. Okay, it's a very interesting platform. So yes, I think we are about time. So thank you very much, Art, for your your valuable talk and your valuable time for the Q and A session. So I would like to also thank the audience for coming and listening to us. So thank you very much, and I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye. guys.
Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.